Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. I'm so tired today. I only got two hours of sleep. Have another cup of cold. Yeah, I should, right? Um, yeah, I just wanted to welcome everyone to Security B Sides 2014. It's my second year um, kind of organizing, leading this, doing it. And again, I, I just want to thank all the attendees, all the volunteers, all the sponsors, and everyone else who made this possible. If it wasn't if it wasn't uh, because of everyone here, we wouldn't have a conference. So I want to encourage open communication. Uh, feel free to tweet. Uh, our hashtag is besides besides BOS. Um, actually, hashtag besides BOS. It's the, actually the two hours of sleep coming in today. <laughs> but uh, just wanted to welcome everyone. Please uh, let's give a hand to uh, for for kind of like a kickoff. Let's uh, just go ahead and clap our hands today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, for, for coming today. And um, it's usually making any of these B-Sides events, it takes maybe a year or more of planning. So again, I, I wanted to thank everyone. And this is our first time doing it one and a half, um, one and a half days. So all the organizers are in a blue shirt, and all the volunteers are in a red shirt. So if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, feedback, let us know. Um, now I just want to introduce Mr. Jack Daniel. He is the co-founder of Security B-Sides, and also is at Tenable Security. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. And who is that? That is a uh, young Isaac Newton. We normally see him when he's old, uh, but in case you're wondering. So, um, so, thank you very much, Roy. Thanks, everybody, for being here, uh, especially to the, the other speakers, the volunteers, the staff that make these things happen. Um, B-sides are important to me. They're important to a lot of people in the community. And I really appreciate the opportunity to join you. Uh, so my, my theme for the next year or two is, uh, has been about, and is going to be about, uh, trying to move forward uh, by doing some of the things we already know how to do. And we'll start out with this. This doesn't make headlines, uh, but uh, you know, the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has the right idea. Don't panic is a good starting point for us. <laughs> I know that drama is fun. Uh, I know that some folks in this industry kind of like drama. Um, I know that screaming is sometimes fun, uh, but we need to get stuff done and, and perhaps uh, a little calm, rational thought about it can help us. Also, um, we have an amazing ability to solve the same problem time and time again. Uh, we're phenomenal at reinventing the wheel. We're not always good at making it round each time we reinvent it. Uh, but uh, that's, that's it. So I'm Jack Daniel. Uh, why should you listen to me? So I am a co-founder. I'm one of the people that sustains B-Sides. I was involved since before the first one, just for a little point of reference, five years ago today, um, B-Sides was not actually even a thought. Um, this is event number 124 globally in less than five years. Today there's another event going on. It's actually wrapping up right now because they're seven hours ahead of us in Algiers. It's their third annual one in Algiers, to give you an idea of what the scale of this is. We'll talk about that in a little more. Uh, but I help sustain that community because it helps sustain me. Every time I get fed up with the amount of time and effort I put into it, then I come to an event like this and it's cool. Meet with people, meet old friends, meet new friends, uh, see the community connect, and it's like, let's do it again. Uh, technically, I uh, have no technical skills. I, I'm an auto mechanic. I'm not sure how I'm here or why anybody listens to me. <laughs> um, the really short version is one day I had to find my own parts, and since I knew how to use the computer kind of, because I worked on Renaults where nobody would touch them, I had to look at my own parts. If you look at your own parts, I ended up, I don't know, somehow I became responsible for parts. If you do parts, they hand you a tape and it has the new spark plug prices on it. This is going back many decades. And then if you're in a car dealership, a tape that has an operating system on it or your line of business app is the same as the one that's got the spark plug prices on it. So you give it to the guy in the parts department. And so uh, I eventually ended up uh, running all of IT for a bunch of car dealers, a chain plus some others that I was moonlighting. And as all of us that you know started out as network and systems admins, bad stuff happened. I had to fix it. 
it happened again. I had to figure out how to keep it from happening again. Um, bad people did bad things because it was Windows 98 and NT and those sort of things. And so that meant having to learn how to keep it from happening and make it better, and that's information security in a nutshell. One day, you know, seven years ago, I ended up seeing where the car business was headed and went from that being my primary source of income, being security and technology in that industry to vendor space. Uh, vendor space, doing support and other things, uh, firewall support, and doing a lot of community stuff. I was involved in the local NACI chapter since the beginning. Unfortunately, I haven't had much time to be involved in that group or other local groups with, with travel in the past couple of years. But, uh, you know, I, I started doing more and more community engagement as part of my job, and I started doing things like working with the sales teams. Um, sorry, but, you know, and then, uh, you know, for the past three years, I've been at Tenable, and I report to the VP of Marketing, so I'm technically in marketing, and uh, I know that's like a bad word to a lot of people, but because I'm in marketing, I was introduced to a really new term. You want to try? Change the mic. There we go. Oh, look at that one. Better battery. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, let's turn this off so you don't have to listen to the shuffle. All right. Or is this one? Maybe I can just... Hello? Oh, we just need it okay. closer. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I'm not going to clip it to my beard. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Is that any better? Eh, a little bit better. I'll, I'll yell. That'll make up for it. Uh, so anyway, I was introduced to a bizarre concept once I joined a marketing team. Those of you that are network and systems administrators and security people, um, you would be terrified to know that what happens in marketing is I had, was introduced to the concept of having budget. Um, <laughs> it's how we can sponsor events like this and a lot of other things. Uh, but I also get to be very technical because we're a technical company. Uh, and so people like Paul Sidorian and myself and uh, Space Rogue and people like that are marketing people uh, where I work. But marketing is cool because it lets me do things like this. It lets me talk to people, listen to customers. Um, and continue to drive. And uh, so I talk to a lot of people. I see what's happening in the world. I remember what it's like to work for a living. I spent a lot more years as an unbudgeted admin, uh, it, which all sums up to you really shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> um, that's, that's just the truth. Why? Uh, and here's why. Uh, you know your environment better than I do. You know your challenges better than I do. So here's what we do. You can uh, pay, ignore me until I say something that uh, you like, and then you can tell your boss, hey, even that old fool knows it. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to tell you some stuff you know, hopefully in context you haven't thought about, but I'm going to tell you some things that you know. Now, at first I thought, that's really not well, but I, I've done little bits of this elsewhere to, to see how it's going to go over, and it turns out my, somebody pointed out to me that there's really, uh, there's really nothing wrong. Uh, KPMG, Deloitte, uh, PwC, Ernst & Young, uh, you know, people like that wouldn't exist if there wasn't billions to be made on telling people stuff they already know. <laughs> so, I'm going to do it for free, which maybe means I'm not good at business, but um, uh, I'm also hopefully going to add some context that's usable, uh, unlike Deloitte. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but first, a couple of things. We are at B-Sides. You are here. As I mentioned, that's a, a, event 124. There's, Algiers is happening today. Uh, the green dots are ones that are upcoming. Some of them are tentative. Dubai is kind of off and on. Singapore is likely to happen. The ones in India, I expect at least one of those to happen this year. Uh, you can see the US is well represented. Canada, actually I did not, because we got confirmation he's got a venue. There will also be one up in Cape Breton. Um, there's a second one. Look at that. See, I meant to uh, I grabbed the wrong screenshot. Uh, let's put one here, too. Uh, Manchester is happening. Um, there are a handful of others. And this happens because local organizers make it happen and the local community participates and volunteers make it happen. So I said, this is event 124. Uh, there were... Uh, tomorrow is San, uh, San Antonio, event number 125. Uh, there were about 41 or 42 events last year in the calendar year. Probably going to exceed that this year. Uh, as long as the events serve their need, that's great. There's a lot of people that talk about having too many uh, cons. 
And my take is, yeah, there are some that, are, that seem redundant to me, but in the B-Sides community, if everybody leaves happy and the organizers do not leave bankrupt, um, that's pretty good. And as someone who has floated a lot of money to B-Sides over the years, that last one means something. But it's about connecting people. Um, some of the first events, I met some folks whose careers started to advance very quickly just by connecting to the right people. Uh, people who suffered less because they knew who to reach out to in, the, in their community. And that's the real power of this, is the conversational aspect of it in the community. And it's a very flexible model. 14 Australians at the Gold Coast at a pub during the night after a more traditional conference. Everybody's happy. Well, they're Australians, so they have a pretty good head start on that. Uh, but everybody's happy, has something to drink, and they leave happy. That's great. Uh, Las Vegas, we have no idea how many people we're going to have at Las Vegas this year, but I would not be surprised if we go over 1,200. We have a 350-room room block and a 700-room hotel, to give you an idea of the scale of that. Um, if, you'd love, if you'd like to be involved, uh, this team would love to have more volunteers. Uh, every B-Sides team would like to have more volunteers. Uh, if you've got the time to be an organizer, that's great. Um, it, it happens because of community. It happens. We, uh, it's very, I don't know, buzzwordy, but it really is about community. That's an abused word with social media. It's about connections and conversations, which are abused terms, but it's real here. We'd like to talk about having sponsors, not vendors. A lot of company, a lot of big conferences say they have sponsors. They do not, they have vendors. These people will happily take your money, but they're supporting the community. Um, they're sponsoring this community. You're not attendees, you are participants. Uh, if this is your first B-Sides, welcome. It's fantastic to have you here. One of the things I like to say about B-Sides is, one of the things you will not find at the B-Sides is that handful of people wearing the Founders Circle logo, right? Or some other crap like that. We're a growing community. Growing structures need growing foundations. If this is your first B-Sides, welcome to the Founders Circle, because this is what it takes. We're all participants. There's no audience. I'm uh, in danger of getting optimistic and idealistic, so I'm going to move on. Uh, another first thought. Normally, I talk about the DBIR a couple times a year, and here's my take on the 2014 DBIR. Everyone needs to read it, but I found it both overwhelming and underwhelming. Um, it, do it doesn't get better, people. It doesn't really. Um, <laughs> They, they did some stuff I didn't like. One of the things that they tried to do is they tried to do trending every year. <laughs> if you pay attention year after year, which you should, it's one of the reports I actually print on paper. I kill trees for it. And I scribble things in the margin. The overwhelming part is they added incident data, not just breach data. Not known, compromised, and lost data, but they added incident data. It kind of muddied the waters and made it overwhelming. I've never written WTF in the margin of a 60-page uh, document as much as I did, because from figuring out the numbers, is this incident or is it just breach? Um, and then they try to do trending, and one year lull set completely blows all the trends out of the water. Uh, and then we have a quiet year, and it goes back to the Eastern Europeans scanning for 3389 and popping micros point of sale terminals. And then we have uh, the, the, the gangs doing ATM skimmers or gas station skimmers, and so the numbers get skewed wildly. Um, the industry is not mature enough to trend well, is what I learned from this. They do try. I, I found that uh, they kind of lost focus this year, but it's still a lot of good information. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to find stuff to scare people into uh, supporting your ideas. Uh, good read. I just uh, had to mention DBIR. If you haven't read it, you really need to. It is 60 pages. Uh, read the first couple of pages. The summary is pretty good. Um, we can digest it all. There is some real value in, in drilling into it, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about this. This quote is, everyone knows it, it's uh, widely abused. Um, that's actually part of a larger quote. The full quote is uh, from George Senayana, a uh, philosopher. Um, Progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. When change is absolute, there remains no being to improve and no direction is set for possible improvement. And when experience is not retained, as among savages, infancy is perpetual. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. 
So as among savages, infancy is perpetual. Now, that's kind of a Western judgmentalist statement, but there is truth in if you don't remember yesterday, you're not gonna, you know, if you don't remember the lessons of dropping the big blocks on your toes, you're not gonna build the pyramid, right? You, you've gotta retain it. Um, we kind of suck at this in technology and in security especially. All right, if that was a little too deep and too heady, another of the greatest philosophers of our time summarized it a little bit better. <laughs> I know he was a Yankee, uh, but it's, it's uh, I also know that uh, by sabermetrics and other things, he's probably the best catcher uh, baseball has ever had. Uh, and he was a great source of quotes. So yeah, it's the same stuff all over again. So what's the newest problem? I was asked to do a talk about BYOD earlier this year and it really set me off. Um, latest problem, people are connecting to our stuff and we're losing control and it terrifies us. Is that really new? No. Well, here's our data center, 1963-1964 data center at NASA. And here's our remote connectivity problem. She may not even be in the same damn room. Ah! Now, in fairness, you can literally follow a wire to this. It may be a long wire, but this is where we realized that we had to do some stuff, right? So here we go. What's really keeping us awake at night is dumb terminal connections, right? And how much have we learned? Yeah. All right, a little, little more realistically, that was not the end of the world. The end of the world came when we moved to a client server model, because this was the end of the world, because we put power in too many places. We were never going to be able to manage this out of control. What do you mean you're going to have computers under the desk that can do stuff? And some of them will be big enough to talk to other machines. That's crazy. And then we put a lot of them together and virtualized stuff. And this was cool because we could make the mistakes that it used to take months to make when we had to buy and provision a server. We could make the same mistakes in seconds if we had enough horsepower. Now the lie of virtualization was we had to rewrite a lot of apps to take advantage of it and we had to buy much bigger servers. So the first few rounds took those same set of months and then we had to misconfigure virtual networking before we could misconfigure the physical networking they were connected to. But now we've gotten better at that and soon we'll have this, uh, you know, Cisco NSX and all the software-defined networking where we can instantly misconfigure our networks and that's progress. But, um, you know, this was the end of the world. And I remember at an ASIC meeting like eight years ago or something saying, virtualization is going to mean NT4 never dies. <laughs> um, I told you so. Uh, <laughs> And then the obligatory cloud computing crappy stock photo. Now I don't even have to own the hardware or colo rent it or anything. I can spin this up. I can make the same mistakes in record time on somebody else's hardware. Um, that's, that's awesome. That's stunning. Each iteration, we've had a common set of problems and a common set of values or advantages that these brought. And then each iteration brought new challenges as well as new opportunities. But we like to scream and, and scream about access control every time we iterate through. And now we've got this BYOD thing. And if you think about it, if your phone is like my phone, which is now a year and a half old, so it's only got a quad core 32-bit processor, not a quad core 64-bit processor like a modern phone, um, that's the same as connecting to a desktop or a laptop, right? I mean, it's, my, my little Surface RT here has a Snapdragon. It's a joke of a processor. It's more powerful than you know, the things that we thought were rockets on the desktop. It's a quad-core 64-bit chip and what we consider basically a throwaway tablet. And so we've had all of these things and now the Internet of Things is gonna kill us all, right? The thingularity, as some call it. Uh, the Internet of Things, what do we do with that? Well, so this is interesting from a business perspective we have nothing to worry about because we know that we don't bring consumer devices into the corporate environment. We never do that. Right. Okay, all right, so we do, but they're always on properly VLAN or better yet, physically segmented network segments. Oh, damn. Um, wait, but we learned
We learned that different machines have, should have different functions and different people should be connecting to the different applications running there. So this really isn't the big problem, right? I mean, we, we know how to do this, but we're gonna panic about all of it again. The truth is the internet of things is I think my first thought is we will probably see these ship with, I don't know, SNMP and UPnP and NTP enabled on the dumb things. And the, the first thing is our personal networks are going to be, people's privacy is going to be further degraded if that's possible. Um, when am I supposed to stop doing this, by the way? Yeah, I got plenty of time. Detour tangent, <laughs> privacy. Here's my take on privacy. I hate Google, but I use the Google stuff, right? I hate Google. Here's our privacy challenge. I've, I've given up on privacy, and here's why. I was in San Francisco uh, before RSA. I was actually doing a VMware uh, partner exchange event. I go back to the hotel. At the end of it, I look at my phone. Those of you that have Androids, you know that Google sometimes like just pops up and tells you stuff randomly. And it's like, hey, you looked up where, you know, you Googled one memorial circle and say, hey, it's time to leave, right? So I look at my phone, and it says, Junior Brown is playing at the Oceans. Now, Junior Brown is a phenomenal guitarist, Americana musician. So I've, I've checked his website a few times from things where I was logged into Google. Phone obviously knows where I am. I haven't asked the phone anything. My phone says to me, hey, dummy, looks like you're bored in San Francisco. One of your favorite artists is over there. And I won't say here, but I, I hurled a few F-bombs at my phone and said, intercourse thyself, Google, you bastard. And then I clicked on you. She's called, they had tickets available, and I walked across town to see the show. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's uh, the challenge and reward of privacy. <laughs> Ah, oh, man, that's great. You, say, you, got, you got tickets? Yes, we got tickets. Do I need to buy them now or can I just walk? Yeah, just walk in. Um, so <laughs> there's privacy. So Internet of Things, also I think reflective attacks. It might, I wouldn't be surprised if, if networks get crippled from dumb stuff left open. Um, who knows? I, all the Internet of Thing things, most of them thankfully only support Telnet and HTTP for management, so they're not vulnerable to heart bleed. Uh, but, those, <laughs> but, but those that are, um, those that are going to be vulnerable forever. Hey, Jack, I had a, I had a good thing yesterday. I had a, um, the, the telephone company called me, so, I mean, my electric company. They asked me if it was okay and would I be interested in this new service where they could, like, reach into my house. And oh, yeah. Of my equipment at, you know, times of their choosing when the, when the electric rates were high. Right. So there are places where they do that smart metering and they tie it into your, you know, they tie it into your thermostat and other things and where they do, you know, time-based rating and things like that. And that's, it has some promise. I will say this, one of the first smart, smart grid, smart electric uh, organizations I had the mispleasure of dealing with um, used smart meters throughout a neighborhood as a test. And it didn't think, they didn't really think about how significant the robustness of DHCP was. And they had a power outage on an underpowered network. And it took them 20 or 30 minutes to resolve the power outage. And it took over three hours for the slow network to be able to hand out addresses to all of the meters. So people were without power because they couldn't be metered because they didn't know what to do, and so somebody said Active Directory runs DHCP, so they connected it to the power company's Active Directory to push DHCP. Um, I spend more time in Windows than anything else, but using Windows for DHCP is really stupid. Microsoft has yet to figure out DHCP in a reliable manner. Uh, it is amazing what a, your watch can run DHCPD and DHC client on a, on a Linux chip kernel and scale beyond anything Active Directory can do today. Um, it's still true. However, I think Microsoft pretty much has wins nailed. Um, <laughs> uh, so some of you may have seen this before. Uh, the last time I showed this, it had pictures of cute kittens on it. I've taken the kittens out, but here's, here's sort of this mental exercise that I've been doing lately is 
Let's talk about the problem space and security. This is actually two graph, two charts, plus a footnote. So let's ignore this one, solution deployment. Let's divide all of information security into stuff we know is bad and stuff that we know how to fix, right? And uh, every day, new bad stuff becomes made known to us. Um, I don't think there's a right answer here, but I'm gonna challenge some assumptions. So our, our problem space, where are we? We write new code, we have new problems in the new code, plus we find problems in old code. And then we figure out, after we find the problems, it takes us a while to figure out how to solve them, and then solution deployment, we don't fix the stuff we know how to fix. This is a viable way to look at it, and this is, I think, the pen tester view, the vulnerability manager view. This is the way those of us that are testing systems see the world. If we talk to people that have been in this industry a while, particularly if they're in academia, not the, I'll be kind, not the people who are a little disconnected from reality, but the people in academia like SPAF, who's seen the real world. Um, you know, people that get it might offer this, and I'm, I've become one of these people. The problem space is actually extremely well defined. And we haven't heard from Mark Dowd in what, like three years. There hasn't been a new, totally new class of bugs that we have to really worry about. There have been some new variations, but we pretty much know what goes wrong. And if we abstract the solution, I'm not saying this is easy, but let's abstract the solution to input validation and authentication and things like that. We actually know how to fix more problems than we know about. We can head off the couple of you know, upcoming things. Um, the one that I think we can all agree on is no matter where we put the first two bar charts, uh, I think this is terribly optimistic on, on our rate of solution deployment. Uh, where do we go from there? So let's be practical for a while. Um, yes, I work for a vendor. Uh, you want to give us money? Cool. Don't talk to me. I don't want your money. I want you to use whatever. Uh, but let's ask two questions about our environment. What do you have and what do you know? So I recently did a talk on patching your patch management process. These two, the answers to these two questions were, you know, the question was, what's the best tool to use? And my answer was, I have two answers. It's the tool you have and the tool you know, because you can be a little better tomorrow with what you know. In patch management, that's not really true. There are better tools out there than what you've got, probably. Most of us don't have the budget to do it well, but the reality is if you're trying to scrape by with an intern running Windows Update and WSUS, push that to its limit, hopefully you score a few quick wins and you move forward. But what do you have and what do you know? And we need to stop and think about that. And then this actually gets um, a little bit deeper because once you think about that, we, we can consider what is real and what's not, um, what we can do something about, uh, what do you have, kind of leads into inventory, um, come back to that. So I was in uh, Oslo this past weekend, actually Wednesday morning I woke up in Oslo and Wednesday night I went to bed in my own bed. Um, I, in uh, suburban Oslo, it's not suburban anymore, uh, this has been moved there. This is one of the uh, Norwegian uh, stave churches. To give you an idea of the age of this. Some of the columns internally in this church, um, a couple of the columns were dated to 1174 and 1208. That was from a renovation. Um, not far from here is the Viking Ship Museum, where they have two, they have three ninth century Viking ships that were used as burial ships. Uh, so there's some old stuff here. Uh, these are called stave churches because they split along lengthwise, and so they have these huge long staves that run up and down, and that's what the churches are. So this is uh, this is as we're turning Vikings from marauders into Christians. They started building these churches. Uh, they're beautiful. It's not just because I am mostly Norwegian. You can tell by the pear-shaped figure, male pattern baldness, etc. cetera. Um, this is a, a cultural icon. It's also surrounded by other wooden historic things. This is at a, you know, 
it's I think Sturbridge Village or something, but a millennia old and beyond in some cases. Uh, there are wooden buildings all around it. It's irreplaceable. Uh, even though the outside is largely a reproduction of another one, the core of that, that center core. So what's the danger of a millennia old wooden building? So it was a rainy day when I was there, but fire is what kills wooden things. So if you take a close look, they did some threat modeling, and this thing is lit up. There's copper pipe everywhere because they know what they've got, they know the value, and they know what it's worth investing in. Really simple threat model. If you want a lot better threat modeling than this, Adam Shostak's got a new book. Adam, buy the book, buy the card game. Steal the book from somebody and read the first three paragraphs. I mean, the first three chapters, if you haven't. Quick pitch for Adam. Even if you don't do threat modeling, the first few chapters of this book are great because it walks you through thinking about threat modeling. Um, he, he's, he's one of the people in the, the new school of information security. One of the idealistic youths, although he's not that young anymore. So let's go back to fundamentals. Things that, things that happened when we had tape spinning on machines, which I'm actually not that old. Classification. Well, before we can do classification, we have to know what's going on in our environment. So anybody familiar with the SANS Top 20, the 20 critical security controls? It's a pretty good list. I'm not thrilled with it because it's sort of like training wheels. Uh, but it's a great model to use in your environment because nobody's making you do it. So you can tune it. You can pick three and say, I'm going to do these. You can use it as, as a you know, yardstick. It is one of the two guidelines that I like to point people to because you, you control how you approach them. First thing on that is find all the stuff in your environment. Not just the stuff that's supposed to be there, but the stuff that isn't. Um, which is brutally honest because there's stuff in your environment that doesn't belong there. And then item two is find all the stuff running on the stuff in your environment, authorized or not. I mean, that's a challenge, right? If, if, the, if everything's joined to Active Director and you're managing it through SCCM, that's great. It's the unmanaged stuff that's killing us. Um, just for reference, so item one is find all your stuff, and then item two is find the stuff running on the stuff. The other one that I refer people to is the Australian Signals Directorate, top 35. That is not training wheels. Item one there is not find your stuff. Item one there is application whitelisting. One of these is a, you gotta be this high to ride this ride, but it's based for basically the Australian NSA. But it's some great stuff there. They actually do some cool stuff like tell you how hard it is to implement, um, what it's gonna cost to implement, ongoing costs, and what kind of mitigations, whether it prevents stuff from happening, whether it makes it easier to find it, whether it makes it easier to recover. Uh, Australian Signals Director does a great thing. But so some of the things that we have to do to do any of this, we gotta know everything we've got, we gotta know where our users are, our assets are, our data, and then we classify that. So you can wire in your terminal and log into this box. This is, not, this is nothing new, but we get this wrong all the time. Our environments are way too complex. 20 years ago, when I was 25, 30 years ago, when I was still a mechanic, uh, I could understand everything happening in the cars, including the rudimentary computers that were there, because they were microcontrollers at best, and they, uh, they were basically mirroring the function that we had done with vacuum and hydraulics or with centrifugal force. So ignition spark advance was done by weights that flung out and twisted a plate so that the points would rotate around the distributor. And so the first electronics were mirroring things that I could do and physically see. We moved into fuel injection and it was mirroring a lot of what we were doing mechanically. Now it started to get a little more entertaining and then we started putting sensors in and tuning things and that was when it was fun to be a mechanic because you could uh, go to Radio Shack buy a bag of resistors and you could shunt and ground and you could lie to the computers because it didn't do sanity checking on those sensors and uh, for a few bucks and some time and maybe as long a warranty controller or two you could, uh, you could push performance and other things. You could also fix problems. Uh, but now, on your automobile, you can't. You have no idea what's going on. In computer systems, you could ask a computer science a graduate student 20 years ago, 
to explain everything that happened in a, in a computer system in a three second window. You can't do that with your phone now. It's not, it's, the complexity is impossible. So what am I telling you about fundamentals? Well, pick what matters. Gross oversimplification, but users, we heard this one before, not everybody needs to be a domain admin. Not everybody needs to be a local admin. Our executives have access to data that other people shouldn't have access to. Start with the obvious, small wins, move forward. I, we all do this. I'm pointing here, the, uh, it works. That's why I keep this 15 year old thing because uh, it's smarter than I am and it's got a strong enough signal. So here's one that took me a while, but those of you that still fight these battles know this one. What's the most, one of the most empowering things in security? It's the ability to fix stuff, right? I applied a patch, it didn't go well. Quick, fix it before they yell at me. Um, this has real advantages beyond this though, because everything else gets better. Machines get popped, you can, if you've got the ability to image quickly, there are a couple of things you can do. You can grab an image of that critical server that's been compromised, hand it off to the incident response folks. If you have a more mature program, what you can probably do is shift that backup to a new iron or a new virtual instance and take that intact attack system, shut it down and move it into a lab environment. But you don't even lose the machine. You just recover quickly. It means that Thunder and lightning strike and uh, you know, the power bounces up and down until all your UPSs go away because everything important is on a UPS that's got a good battery, right? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> nobody does anything dumb like puts generators in the basement and flood areas. Well, you know. Uh, <laughs> wait, okay. So the ability to recover makes the whole, uh, the whole thing a lot better. It also means you can actually update Exchange because anybody that's ever run Exchange knows there's no such thing as too many good backups when you're applying a service back to Exchange or doing a migration. Um, images, copies, whatever you've got gives you that. A, a bad analogy that people use in, in security often is that you know, security is like brakes on your car because it's an enabler. Putting brakes on your car allows you to go faster. At the extreme, that's true. Uh, any, Buddy that's driven a car with no brakes would know that actually what, what is really cool about brakes is they let you stop the car. Um, bad analogy. I use a lot of them, but that one's just really bad. Uh, if anybody's into sports car racing, one of the things you find is last year's fastest car is not this year's fastest car. And so what is the first thing you do when you're just a little behind? You roll into the pits, you jack up the car, you pull the rear brakes off and put them back in the trailer. You've just now lost 30, 40, 50 pounds and that might be enough to keep you in the game. What did I do? I threw away my brakes to go faster because brakes slow you down. Um, but <laughs> backups actually speed things up. It allows us to screw up and, and not have a problem. Perimeter and access control. So I was in the firewall business for a while. Um, I'm a huge believer in firewalls. I won't tell this audience that a firewall is a security device. I won't tell anyone that a firewall is a security device. It's a network health device at best. And it is also a phenomenal choke point for traffic analysis and monitoring. It is a stunning place to see what is happening in your network. It's a great place to do a comparison, what's happening inside and out of your network. So the perimeter is kind of a dead idea, but it, we still rely on it. We have way too much faith in the boxes at the edge, but the boxes at the edge really do give us some great visibility and they help us sort things out. Um, but we do it wrong. One of the things that terrifies me is IPv6. So here's how we do perimeter and access control. Um, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can kind of see the footprints where they, they don't even... Um, <laughs> so if we do it right, it can do us some value. What does it do? Well, you know, again, the pen test mentality, because you focus on that, this isn't gonna stop me. It's not supposed to stop you, but it might let me see you. Um, we do it right, we can, we can kind of decide what's inside, what's outside, clean up the traffic enough to make it easier to spot what's inside and what's out. Here's another one. If you're up against a really skilled pen tester or attacker, segmentation's only gonna slow them down. Maybe not that. Isolation and segmentation, however, really are valuable. 
when I was first a network admin, I was a big fan of huge flat networks. No bumps in the wire, makes things easy to diagnose, performance is higher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the slowest network interface that you can find that involves a wire or fiber is gigabit, and that's been true for, what, a decade now? Um, 40 gig stuff is used at reasonable prices. Uh, you know, 40 gig, you can't talk um, to anybody in, in big industry if you're only doing 40 gig. You know, ask, ask the folks at the Akamai table if 40 gig throughput means anything to them, right? You know? <laughs> Not even at the edge, uh, you know. Um, so the bump in the wire, the big flat network, and uh, break things up. Well, if it doesn't stop the bad guys, well, wait a minute, it stops the dumb ones and the lazy ones and the opportunistic ones. That's pretty cool. The other beauty of segmentation, back to the car business, these are Holly Jets. This is one of multiple jets, uh, jet kits that still lives in my house. So what do we have? Well, they don't slam into each other, and if I want a number 40, I look to the bin that says 40, and all that's in there is a 40. So if I look in there and all I should see in there is SQL traffic, all I see is SQL traffic. If I see anything that's not SQL traffic, I don't have to... I'm, I'm sorry, Steenan, IDS is not dead if I can look in here and say, if not SQL traffic, tell me about it, right? And you add NetFlow, because everybody uses NetFlow, because all of us old beardy Unix network guys been screaming about NetFlow forever, right? NetFlow. There's an unusual amount of SQL traffic in this bin. Ooh, what happened? Oh, DBA's box got popped, it got pivoted off, and so there's terabytes of data going somewhere that it shouldn't. This is practical, this is hands-on. I can't do this in the entire environment. Okay, you got credit card data in a SQL database. Let's put that one in a bucket. Let's watch it. Um, Yeah, who logs in? So one of the things, BYOD stuff, I was told, uh, people are freaking out about BYOD, and some people are, and I, I get it, there are new challenges there. And uh, so, identification, authentication, authorization, I lump these together. Um, all right, so I, identification's not always easy. <laughs> Is it me? Oh, um, uh, but here's the BYOD thing. I was doing this talk on BYOD. I took out my phone and said, would anyone like to hijack one of my domains? And I held up my phone. It's over there, I'm not gonna. And I said, you need this. Oh, sorry, it's too late. The numbers change as the dials are spinning on Google Authenticator on my phone. Oh, you should make people bring their phones to work and use them for work as long as they're using your Authenticator. Maybe it's the wicked uh, open source package. Uh, look, SMS, open my SMS at this event. Like, I'm drinking with Alex Hutton tonight. Well, that's nothing unusual. Uh, oh, look, I logged into MSDN to download something. So there's my live hit. Oh, I logged into Twitter from a different location. I logged into a different Google property. From, I logged into uh, a, a Hotmail account that I use for certain specific. Oh, look at that. And, oh, look, I drank with Alex last night. Uh, but wait, this, this machine of death and destruction does have the challenges people talk about. But why don't we focus on what's new? We have a properly segmented network. I only get access on my phone to the things I should have. I have to connect with Active Sync so that the Exchange admins have control over what I do and my passwords. Uh, you know, you have to put an agent on if that's the way your company works. There's some real power in that. Now you lose that device, it needs to have passphrases on it, it needs to have crypto. The step I missed was I had to put in my password and into Text Secure because I use, uh, you know, Text Secure and Red Phone on my phone. Um, but it gave me a device which is mine because if I know the pins and passwords and things on it and can get to those things, I can use those two-factor authentication modes. So I'm actually moving us forward. There's still bad things with letting people have computers in their pocket that are more powerful than anything on the planet had when we sent them into the moon. There are still challenges there. But if we focus only on the challenges, the industry leaves us behind, and they should. <laughs> this was in the deck before Heartbleed, I swear. But if you want a case for why we need better revocation, uh, Heartbleed is it. Um, our browsers, you, 
tend not to look at revocation lists because that slows down browsing and it makes us mad. And now the size that revocation lists are getting, it's going to be really ugly. And then if they fail to look up, they're going to all fail open. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm still a proponent of if you have small enough networks to throw enough horsepower at it, doing SSL proxies where it makes sense because you can offload some of that to the SSL proxy at, the, at your gateway points, let it um, cache those certificate revocation lists and look things up. Um, but whatever works for you, think about that. And it, it comes back to a real problem we have with, with definitions of trust. Um, in, we talk about trust in technology the way we talk about it with people and it just simply doesn't work that way. Uh, both Brian Snow and Gene Spafford are more eloquent about this, but trust in a human relationship was based on family units, it was based on tribal units, community units. There were certain levels of implied trust and there was a certain type of trust revocation. Trust revocation included some forgiveness and then you crossed a line and then it was really hard to get back. It took a long time to get it back. And there was transitive revocation too because I no longer trust you, I don't trust your family anymore. And that's the way the human mind at the, at the top of our spinal column works with trust. And then we ask VeriSign for a certificate. Um, it doesn't work. Uh, but we need to think about how we revoke things. So who runs a lot of labs at home? Anybody else? I know there are a lot of people that run a lot of labs. So where, where do I submit my self-signed certs for revocation? Uh, <laughs> oops. Um, that's kind of a challenge. I'm tearing through. Validation and monitoring. Here's something we fall down on too, because we don't have the resources that we often need. Um, we do something and we trust it. We trust that WSUS has actually pushed the patches out. We trust SCCM has pushed the patches out. We know better, um, but we, we trust those systems. We trust that uh, whatever vulnerability management system you're using has found everything and you don't spot check it. You make assumptions about false positives and false negatives. Uh, and then we don't monitor. So what we've done now is we've added some tools and we blindfolded ourselves and we're walking around blind. So this is hard. I, I do have an observation on logging and monitoring. Uh, some people disagree with me, but there's a, a real challenge in monitoring things. And if you don't have a mature log management system, log analysis system, uh, well, if you don't have a mature SIM or log system that's properly tuned and used well, that makes you normal. Um, <laughs> that makes you common. Um, if you've got a well-tuned SIM that's doing what you need in your environment, uh, and it's actually doing that, it makes you a unicorn. You know, talk to Anton Chuvak and he wants to talk to you. You know, he collects those uh, like unicorn tears and he doesn't have a full bottle yet. Um, but how do we get better with this? And this is again, I'm not solving any problems, I'm making tomorrow suck less is my goal. Um, <laughs> I can beat that, so what? I, I will make someone slightly less stupid have to compromise us instead of the really dumb people. So what do we do with logging and mon monitoring? Let's keep more information for a shorter period of time. If you're resource constrained and randomly look at stuff, there are all sorts of tools out there that help you find things. From manually grabbing log files or event files, grabbing something like an old tool like Mandiant Highlighter and crawling through logs manually if you're not a, a, you know, a grep user. Um, the way we do log stuff, even those of us who live in log analysis and, excuse me, big data and, and you know, analytics and things, there are times when we end up using tools like grep and um, Excel, right? I mean, Excel, Excel, when it went to a million rows by a million columns, suddenly we can do some crazy stuff in there. Also, it does a pretty good job of parsing XML. So we can do some crazy stuff. I wouldn't want to use it on a daily basis, but you know, sooner or later, man, everything ends up in Excel. Um, as long as it's only occasionally. But look at stuff. And uh, you know, if you're new to this, if you're new to these monitoring things, absolutely, you got to look at the top 10. Because everybody wants to talk about the top 10. You look there. And let's make sure that, you know, uh, FTP isn't the number one protocol in your environment. There's kind of a fall down of that that I've seen is nobody baselines their network. 
So what is the top 10? Is that really a part of what's supposed to be a part of the baseline? That's right, so the, the, the observation is nobody baselines their network. And so what we can do, practically speaking, short term is, well, it looks like it got worse. I don't know if it was good or bad. It looks like it got worse and pick away at it. But the one thing I will ask you to never, ever skip is looking at the bottom five or bottom 10. Why does, I'm not worried about the bottom 10. Okay, you have four machines out of 4,000 that send three packets to an IP in Uzbekistan once a week. Oh, yeah, you know, that, that's more important than knowing whether HTTPS or uh, SSL or SSH is the most important thing in your network. Uh, so take a look at the bottom. Uh, hardening, we used to, everything used to be turned on by default. You know, you install server 2012 R2, it's got a touch screen UI, and that's just stupid. But Microsoft says you don't use the UI in 2012 R2, you use the command line. If I wanted to use command line, I would be running Unix like a real computer, because the reason Microsoft told us to use their servers is because they had a GUI. But, um, little rant there. Uh, <laughs> A touchscreen server interface, thank you very much. Oh, by the way, the latest 8.1 update makes Windows 8.1 suck less. Um, but uh, hardening, hmm? Then what? Then earlier versions of 8.1, or heaven forbid, 8. It's, it's, and here's a challenge. Uh, you want all this cool built-in hardening that's in 8? Except for the IE, of course. Um, you've gotta go to the horrible UI that we all hate. Um, but whatever. So there's still things that need to be hardened. The adoption rate of Microsoft Emmet is depressingly low. Yes. Uh, and it's a good tool. There are other things. Um, a lot of things are turned off by default now. They should be. We still do stuff like battle SE Linux and say screw it and turn it off because I'll turn it on next week when I have some time to tune it. <laughs> um, so I'm a hypocrite there, so we just throw that one out there. So a couple of closing thoughts. Um, this one you may not be expecting here, but there we go. So I'm not talking about this kind of class warfare. This is one of the more stunning images that uh, I've found on the internet. This is a uh, favela in uh, Sao Paulo. These are uh, private swimming pools on the terraces and then not private swimming pools on the terraces. <laughs> this is a poverty line. Uh, Wendy Nader coined the term the security poverty line about those people, largely in small business, underfunded organizations, nonprofits, education, people that don't have the resources to secure their environments. They don't even know how unsecure they are. If you try to explain it to them, they think you're trying to steal from them or just shut down in fear. And we as an industry ignore them because we can't make money off of them. B-Sides helps, I think. There are a lot of community events where those of us that come from that background or are in that background can learn tips and tricks. One of the things, having been in small business all my life, I'm Tenable was 128 people when I joined three years ago. We're 330 now. At that, it makes it by far the largest organization I have ever worked for in my life, at 330. I'm a small business champion small business advocate, um, it's a mess. That's who the Eastern Europeans have made money off of <coughs> badly configured point of sale terminals for a decade plus now. Um, but here's the deal, I, I say this a lot, our problems, our challenges scale much more effectively than our solutions. If we create a solution that solves a problem for a Fortune 50 company, it probably doesn't help our family. It does not help the coffee shop down the street. If we come up with solutions for the coffee shop down the street, that may actually scale up and help that Fortune 100 company. We need to be a little bit more responsive. It's, it's a dead end, I get it, but it just drives me nuts that our industry ignores them. And on the topic of scalability, I've also said this many times. I have discovered at first it was a hunch, but now at my age, I know for a fact that there is nothing that scales as effectively as human ignorance and stupidity. Um, that is just stunningly effective at scale. So, um, 
So think about that. Uh, you know, think about people doing really dumb stuff at the coffee shop. Don't scare them. A couple of years ago, the DBIR on the last page had a little card you could give the, the lawnmower shop and say, here, this is not from me. This is from people that you probably pay too much for your phone. Read this. And it said, like, make sure that whoever does your credit card terminal changes the password, right? Um, little things like that. You know, you know if, if you got a minute, that's like, Really, use WPA2 on your coffee shop Wi-Fi and put a poster up with the username and password. It's okay, or, you know, just, it's okay. It's better than what you're doing. Um, let's think about those below that poverty line. When we solve problems for them, it gets better. So uh, the shameless self-promotion part of this, uh, I have a couple of blogs. I'm really nice to my readers by hardly ever writing so you don't have to read much. Uh, Travelingcurmudgeon.blogspot.com, I call that my travel blog. It's actually where Jack drinks when he remembers to write about it uh, on the con circuit. Security Weekly, formerly Paul.com. Uh, Paul will be here tomorrow. I'm on that podcast when I can uh, get over there. Uh, if you're one of our customers, we do a weekly podcast. I do not get drunk and throw F-bombs around. Um, it's more corporate focused and, of course, Twitter. And with that... Um, I have one final parting point. This is the beginning of B-Sides Boston. We have the rest of today and all day tomorrow. I'd like to read a quote to you. I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have only been like a boy playing on the seashore, diverting myself and now and then finding a smoother pebble or prettier shell than ordinary, while the great ocean of truth lay undiscovered before me. That was Isaac Newton's take on his own contribution to society and life. He changed the way we view the world forever by focusing on prettier shells and smoother pebbles and exploring them. At B-Sides events and other community-driven events, you have the opportunity to connect with people who share your interests in those shiny pebbles, in those interesting shells. It may be shells at the capture the flag. It may be sim. It may be whatever it is. You can make a difference for yourself and others by participating, by joining in this, finding your pebbles, finding your shells, and enjoying these sides and being part of this community. Thank you very much.